November 30th through December 4th, join James and Teresa Merritt for the sixth annual Mountaintop Conference, featuring overwhelmed but not broken. Three power pack teaching sessions from Dr. James Merritt. We'll have special evenings with Luke Zamperini, Will Graham, and musical entertainment at the Smoky Mountain Opry. There's even an optional day at Dollywood. Meet us on the mountain November 30th through December 4th in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Call 800-523-3919 or visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details. Today on Touching Lives. Do you know why we're afraid of the giants in our life? Do you know why we fear the giants in our life? Because we remember what we ought to forget, and we forget what we ought to remember. You know, you know what we remember? We remember the low points in our life. We forget the high points in our life. You know what we remember? We remember our failures. You know what we forget? We forget our victories. With hope and encouragement for life, this is Touching Lives with James Merritt. What I want to do this morning is I want us to study a man. You're very familiar with him. As a matter of fact, he is the second most mentioned person in all of the Bible. He's talked about more than anyone else except Jesus himself. And to give you a little clue, all I got to do is say one word. You'll know who I'm talking about. And the word is Goliath. And so we're talking about David. Now, anybody that's anybody knows the story of David and Goliath. As a matter of fact, there are people all over the world who've never read the Bible, but they know about David and Goliath. I have met people overseas who've never even seen a Bible, yet they know the story of David and Goliath. And in case you don't, if you have a copy of God's Word or a smartphone or a tablet or an iPad, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Samuel. It's in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 17. You say, I don't know where 1 Samuel, 7, you know, 1 Samuel is. Not a problem. Right before 2 Samuel. So if you'll just turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to look at this story together. Now, you may have been in a medically induced coma for all of your life, or you may be an Auburn graduate. You don't know this story. You're just not real familiar with how this story works. So let me just kind of give you a refresher. The story takes place in a valley called Elah. If you ever go to Israel with me, we will go to the valley of Elah. I've seen this valley many, many times. And so there, you've, you've got this valley, and Israel's mortal enemies, the Philistines, they're camped on one mountain, and a valley away, the army of Israel is camped on the other mountain. And the heavyweight champion of the Philistines, this giant named Goliath, is challenging anybody in Israel, somebody in Israel, to a one-fall, winner-take-all match to see who is going to leave victorious. Well, people all over the world are paying on pay-per-view to see the rally in the valley. Everybody wants to see, how is this fight going to come out? Tickets are being sold at a record pace, at a record price. The only problem is, nobody wants to fight Goliath. Nobody wants any part of the giant. Every day, everybody has a headache. Every day, people are calling in sick. As a matter of fact, things had gotten so bad that King Saul, who, by the way, is the guy that should have fought him, King Saul has even bribed, put out a bribe. He's put out a reward for anybody that will fight this giant. We read about it in verse 25. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king, now listen to this, will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now, here's what was being offered. Fortune, fame, freedom. To rock your world, you've got to face giants. What David knew are the same things we ought to know. And what David realized are the same things that we ought to realize because it's those things that motivated David to do what nobody else was willing to do. And everybody in this room faces giants. You're in a marriage that may not make it. That's a giant. You've got a disease that's debilitating. That's a giant. You're in a financial situation that looks like it's all but insurmountable to get over. You've got a giant. And the truth of the matter is, life is a battle for everybody. And every day when you get up out of your bed and you take your shower and you get your clothes on and you go out to fight another day of the battle called life, 
You will either experience the agony of defeat or the thrill of victory based on whether or not you realize and remember the three things that David did that enabled him to fight his giant. And I want to share with you what those are. Number one, David realized, I have God's power behind me. I realize I've got God's power behind me. Now, we're going to pick up the story in verse 3. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. Now, let me tell you why people can't find Bigfoot. (laughs) He lived about 3,000 years ago, okay? This was the original Bigfoot. This was the incredible Hulk. Nine feet, six inches tall. The guy's so big, his t-shirt weighs 175 pounds. He's carrying a spear, the head of which weighed 25 pounds. This guy was so big, He didn't take steroids. Steroids took him. I mean, this guy is a big, big guy. So when you read verse 24, it shouldn't be too surprising, right? All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him, and they were much afraid. Reminds me of a supervisor I heard about that was talking to the president of his company. And the president looked at him, and he said, do you have any problems in your department? And he said, well, I've just got one. He said, what's your problem? He said, well, he said, in my department, there are six people. And they're all afraid of me. And he said, I've got a small secretary. She's afraid of all of us. He said, I've got no problem controlling them. He said, well, then what's your problem? He said, well, I've got one other person working for me. She's not afraid of anybody. She's not even afraid of me. And the president said, well, why don't you fire her? He said, because I'm afraid of her. Now, (laughs) everybody was afraid of Goliath. Nobody wanted to fight him and to add insult to injury. Goliath was not only a big man, he had a big mouth, and he was really letting them have it every day. And they had to hear the same song on his radio every single day, same words, same lyric, same tune. Verse 8, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? In other words, what are you doing now? You keep coming out here, but nothing happens. Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves. Let him come down to me. For if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, you'll be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And how long has this been going on? Verse verse 16, for 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. For 40 days, almost six weeks, They can't find one man to fight this giant. They can't find a general. They can't find a captain. They can't find a major. They can't find a sergeant. They can't find a book private. They can't find anybody, nobody. The king wouldn't fight. The commander wouldn't fight. The generals wouldn't fight. The special ops wouldn't fight. Nobody would fight. And then one day, everything changed. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away this reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now verse 26 is a turning point in the story. This This is really key to understanding this story. Because it's the first time that God is ever mentioned. You read 25 verses, nobody says a word about God, and then God is mentioned. By the way, these are the first words David ever spoke in the Bible, and I find it so cool that the first words out of David's mouth, he's talking about God. He walks into this camp. He hadn't been there 15 minutes. Everybody else is talking about the giant. David says, why don't we talk about God? 
Everybody else is focusing on Goliath, and David says, why don't we focus on God? Everybody else is mesmerized by the giant. David says, why don't we get mesmerized by God? And finally, somebody shows up that cares more about the glory of God than they do the girth of this giant. Well, as you can imagine, word gets out pretty quickly. Verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they were repeated. They repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. At last, good news spreads throughout the camp. Hey, have you heard? Somebody has finally shown up that's stupid enough to go out and fight this giant. That's the good news. The bad news is he's 19 years old. He's skinny as a rail, red hair, fair skin, freckle face, never fought a battle, never wielded a sword, never picked up a shield, has no military training whatsoever. And that still raises this big question. What would move David to say yes when everybody else said no? What would make David go into the fight when everybody else ran from the fight? Why was he so courageous and everybody else was so cowardly? All right, listen to verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, here's what amazes me. It takes a shepherd boy to go to a king and says to the king, Hey, you remember the God that made you the king to begin with? What about that God? What about him? He has to go to, to, to the king and say, have you forgotten how powerful this God is? Now, I want to show you something. What's this? Do you know why we're afraid of the giants in our life? Do, do you know why we fear the giants in our life? Because we remember what we ought to forget, and we forget what we ought to remember. You know, you know what we remember? We remember the low points in our life. We forget the high points in our life. You know what we remember? We remember our failures. You know what we forget? We forget our victories. And the reason why David could face the present was because of what he remembered from the past. Because with nothing except a staff and a slingshot, David said, I've killed bears. David said, I've killed lions. And see, in doing that, God taught that little shepherd boy one of the greatest lessons you'll ever learn about you and one of the greatest lessons you'll ever learn about God. Listen to this. If you remember what God has done for you, you will trust what God will do for you. But if you forget what God has done for you, you will doubt what God will do for you. See, hindsight gives a lot of insight. And David said to Saul, you know what I've learned about God? What's that, David? God has a perfect track record. But there's a second reason he said yes, Some, something else he knew. He said, I have God's presence beside me. I don't just have God's power behind me. I've got God's presence beside me. Okay, it's time to get it on. And I'll tell you, I love this scene. You can't help but love it. Even Hollywood could not do justice to the drama of the moment. Verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand. And he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bare in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy his ha and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? You can't get away from Georgia. They're everywhere. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to leave the building mentally, telepathically. Leave the building. Go back 3,000 years. You're in the Valley of Elah. Elah, you're right there at this moment. I mean, everything's dead still. There is a hush. Both armies are shocked and stunned at what they're seeing. 
the Philistines are looking at each other and saying, is that the best they got? And the Israelites are looking at each other and saying, is that the best we got? Is that all that we have? The, 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 the Israelites looked at this kid and they covered their eyes because they can't watch. The Philistines, they get out their cameras because they can't wait. I mean, they are excited because both sides knew one thing. This fight's not going to last very long. It's going to be over pretty quick. I mean, they, there's no doubt about this. Now, the reason why the fight didn't last very long is not because of the power of David. The reason why the fight did not last very long was because of the presence of God. Because I want you to listen now to what David says in verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, first time he's even said anything to this guy, he says to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Here's Goliath. He's got his sword. He's got his shield. He's got his armor. He's got his army. And here's David. And all he's got is a stone and a slingshot and God. That's all he's got. But David understood something that nobody else on either side understood. What's this? For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. Now listen, there are some of you that have never understood this story. You've got it all wrong, and I want to help you today. David had a totally different perspective than everybody else on that battlefield. Here was the difference. David was not fighting for God. God was fighting for David. David was not fighting God's battle. God was fighting David's battle. Verse 45, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, a javelin, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beast of the field, of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and he took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. David takes a slingshot, takes a stone about the size maybe of a tennis ball or half of a tennis ball, and he hits Goliath right between the eyes, and he drops him like a bad habit. This is where too many people leave the story. Most preachers leave the story right here. They say, okay, let's pray. All right, we're going to do that in a minute, but not yet. Because we haven't even gotten to the real meaning of this story. We haven't gotten to the deepest part of this story. Because there's one last thing. We'll be brief. There's one last thing we need to remember. Here it is. I have God's purpose before me. I've got God's power behind me. I've got God's presence beside me. I've got God's purpose before me. Now, let me tell you why so many people, and a lot of you, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to talk down to you, but I want to tell you why a lot of you have never really understood the real purpose of this story. The, listen, do you know why, why do you think this story is in the Bible to begin with? You think this story is in the Bible just to show that a little boy could beat a giant? That's not why the story is in the Bible. You say, well, I know why the story is in the Bible to show that I can beat my giants. That's not why the story is in the Bible. The purpose of the battle was not to prove that David could kill a giant. It wasn't even to prove that we can kill our giants. Because when you see the reason why David was willing to risk his own life and how he did it, then you'll understand what this is all about. Let's go back to two verses. That all the earth may know. This is why I'm going to fight this giant. That there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord, what's that word? saves, that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Now watch this. This will be worth the whole trip this morning. This story is much more than about a little shepherd that beat a big giant. This story is not even primarily about David. It's not primarily about Goliath. It's not primarily about you. 
It's not primarily even about me. This, I want to be very, very specific. This is a story about God. Because what David said is this. Let me tell you why I'm going to fight that giant. And let me tell you how I know I'm going to defeat that giant. Here's why. I want all the world to know there is a Lord that saves. In other words, you know what David and Goliath's all about? It's not about a shepherd. It's about a savior. It's not about David. It's about one of his descendants named Jesus. Because by the way, have you noticed the parallels between David and Jesus? Why do you think that we're told specifically the giant came out 40 days? Why do you think, why why not 38? Why not 46? Why are we specifically told that this giant came out 40 days? How many days do you think Jesus had to fight Satan in the wilderness? Somebody tell me. 40 days. And then I'll tell you something else that's kind of interesting. So how does David start the fight? How does David go into the fight? Because remember, David had never been to this valley before. He had never seen this brook before. He had never seen this giant before. He'd never fought in a battle before. You'd think he'd start drawing up battle plans. You'd think he'd start thinking about strategy and tactics. He doesn't do that. Here's what he does. Notice, you go back and you read, the Bible says David knelt. He could have been over and picked up the rock. He didn't bend over. He knelt. And he picked up the rock. Why did he kneel? Because he was saying to his heavenly father at that point, you know, in my flesh, I'm not an idiot. I really don't want to fight this guy. But I know this is what you're calling me to do. So not my will, but yours be done. And 3,000 years later, Another shepherd knelt down in a garden called Gethsemane. He said, you know, I really don't want to fight this battle. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The only difference is he didn't pick up a stone. He picked up a cross. And he went and died on that cross. But unlike his ancestor David, who died, he died, but he came back. From the grave. And see, here is the beauty of this story. You read this story and you go, well, how does that help me, man? I don't have David to fight my battles. You're right. We don't have David to fight our battles for us. We got one far better than David. His name is Jesus. And every morning when you get out of bed, he's standing right there saying, yeah, I've, I've seen the giant. I know the giant. I got him. I can handle it. I can do this. You just put your faith in me. I'll take care of the fight. Don't worry about the giant. You focus on me. And let me tell you why. You don't get up every day and go out and say, well, I sure hope I win the victory today. The victory has already been won. When Jesus came out of that grave 2,000 years ago, he's already won our victory. He's already whipped every giant that you face. You put your faith in him, and he takes care of the fight. Because every day when you get out of bed, I don't care what you face, here's what Jesus is telling you. You've got my power behind you. You've got my presence beside you. You've got my purpose before you. Now, look, I'm going to wrap this up. I don't know what giants you guys face today. I know everybody out there is facing some. Here's just a few. Here's an example. You're sitting there and you're saying, well, I'm not worthy to be forgiven. That's a giant. You're not good enough to be used. That's a giant. (laughs) You can't work this marriage out. That's a giant. You will never get control of your temper. That's a giant. You'll never overcome all those bad habits you've got. That's a giant. You can never be forgiven of that. That's a giant. And you can never change. That's a giant. You're sitting there today and you're saying, nice try, Doc, but you know what? I've been fighting this giant for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and I hadn't whipped him yet. I got some bad news for you. You're not going to. The good news is Jesus already has. When you place your faith and trust in him and you look at him and you say, Lord, I can't defy that giant, and Jesus looks at you and says, you know what? It's not your battle. It's my battle. 
You put me, you give me your faith, and I will give you the victory. Because when Jesus said yes to the cross, it made us able to say yes to him. That frees us to say yes to everything that God has for us. So this is the last thing I want to share. It's a daddy that took his little girl to the carnival. And he would take him on several rides. And they came to this booth where this man was making cotton candy. And he looked at his daughter and he said, honey, would you like some cotton candy? She said, yes, daddy, I really would. So this guy spins out this huge ball, almost as big as she was, this huge ball of cotton candy. And he gives it to the little girl, and the daddy said, now, honey, are you sure you can eat all of that? And with a big smile on her face, she said, oh, daddy, don't worry. I'm a lot bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If Jesus lives in you, he is a lot bigger on your inside than any giant you face on the outside. And every time you say yes to Jesus, you will whip your giant. Have you ever wondered what it must have been like to be in David's shoes when he faced Goliath? To be so full of faith and courage that all you could see was victory? No matter what giant you're facing today, Jesus has already won your victory. Call Touching Lives at 800-413-1131. We want to pray with you as you overcome your giant once and for all. Building on the insights of his best-selling book, 52 Weeks with Jesus, Dr. James Merritt has written a brand new devotional to bring renewal to all who want more of Jesus, a great companion devotional or perfect on its own. Spend time with the one who changed everything. Get your copy of 52 Weeks with Jesus devotional from Touching Lives for $13 or get both books for just $20. Call 800-413-1131 or go to touchinglives.org. November 30th through December 4th, join James and Teresa Merritt for the sixth annual Mountaintop Conference featuring overwhelmed but not broken. Three power pack teaching sessions from Dr. James Merritt. We'll have special evenings with Luke Zamperini, Will Graham, and musical entertainment at the Smoky Mountain Opry. There's even an optional day at Dollywood. Meet us on the mountain November 30th through December 4th in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Call 800-523-3919 or visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details. As a partner with Touching Lives, your generosity is making a kingdom impact all around the world. In addition to sharing the message of Jesus through our broadcast on every available outlet, your gifts are bringing hope to prison ministries, to orphans, and through global missions. Together, we're changing the world for Jesus. Thank you for your support.